Welcome to the e-learning module for searching for veterinary evidence, strategies, and resources. The goals of this lecture are that you will understand the reasoning behind and the steps involved in evidence-based veterinary medicine, and be able to develop a clinical question and construct a search strategy to find evidence in the literature to support an answer to that question. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to meet these learning objectives. This is the most widely used definition of evidence-based practice. It's important to keep in mind that the evidence in the literature is just one facet of your decision making, along with what you've learned in school, what you'll learn through your clinical experience, what you can learn from your colleagues, and so on. Why would you be interested in evidence-based practice? In order to keep up on the progress in veterinary practice, you'll need to keep reading and learning after you graduate, but there will be more research published than you could possibly make the time to read. Evidence-based practice lets you use your time as a clinician more effectively. It's a just-in-time reading of the pertinent information, which is a more patient-centered, problem-based approach to the literature. There are five basic steps to evidence-based practice. We'll be focusing on the first two steps, but it helps to put them in context. The first step is to ask an answerable clinical question. Asking an answerable question means that you're breaking down your need for information into terms and concepts that you can put into a database and that will return good results. When you conduct your search, you'll select the right sources and search structure and conduct a search to find the best available evidence accurately and efficiently. Once you've found evidence that addresses your question, you will critically appraise it. This means reading it and evaluating the evidence for statistical significance, risk factors, and so on. Most importantly, it means determining whether the evidence is relevant and appropriate to your patient in question. When you've completed your critical appraisal, you'll integrate the evidence with what you know about your patient, your clinical experience, and any other information you have to make a decision. Lastly, you'll implement your decision and evaluate it based on outcomes that are important to you and your client. Note that this process is iterative. At any point, you may need to repeat a step, whether it's to refine your search to get better results, to select different articles to critically appraise to support your decision, or to revise your decision based on the outcomes. I've referred to the best available evidence several times and that during your search and appraisal you should consider study type. This is the evidence pyramid. Study types at the top are more statistically rigorous, have larger sample sizes, and are more likely to be broadly applicable in a clinical setting. They're also more scarce. Veterinary medicine has less primary scientific literature than human medicine in general. There are fewer veterinary colleges than medical schools, fewer veterinary researchers than human medical researchers, and fewer studies with strong evidence. You may not find top-tier evidence that relates to your patient or problem. This just means you'll need to give more consideration to other study types. It may be that you just have a single case study to work from, but that it's applicable to your patient or problem. You may also need to consider other sources of information besides the peer-reviewed literature. Sources such as your class notes, textbooks, and the internet can give you enough information to understand a specific problem and can give you a jumping-off point for searching the clinical literature. Your own professional experience, as well as that of colleagues, specialists, and other veterinarians and forums like VIN can help you understand a problem. Where you search for information can also depend on how current you need the information to be. The newest information is often not yet in print. For example, a veterinarian in 2000 who suspected a dog's acute renal failure was due to its eating raisins wouldn't find anything supporting the idea in the literature. The first article on raisin poisoning in dogs wasn't published until 2001. But by talking to her colleagues, either in person or in online networks such as VIN, she could learn that others had seen similar effects in canine patients. The Internet is another source of information that is still news and hasn't yet made it into the scholarly clinical literature. Veterinarians can have a lot of success finding answers to clinical questions through Google or other search engines, but because most of the content on the Internet is not peer-reviewed, you'll need to be cautious when determining the reliability and accuracy of the information you find. Scholarly clinical articles may represent fairly recent research. They have the benefit of having gone through the peer review process and could be found with specialized search databases such as PubMed. However, if you're unfamiliar with a topic, it can be challenging to develop a good clinical question and structure a good search. You can remedy this by starting off searching for background information, which you may find in a book, your class notes, or on the internet. While your textbooks and class notes may be invaluable in helping you understand a problem, remember that they're unlikely to contain current research or standards. Medical textbooks represent the state of knowledge at a point in time, but are somewhat out of date as soon as they're printed. The key to finding the evidence you need is to start by forming a good clinical question that you can search and find answers to in the literature. 
Clinical questions are often about treatment or therapy, but can also be about etiology, risk factors, prevention, diagnostic process, prognosis, or other clinically relevant topics. A model for creating clinical questions that's often helpful is the PICO model. P is your patient, population, or problem. This can be very complex in human medicine, including the patient's age, race, medical history, current medications, etc. In veterinary medicine, we don't need to be so specific. The patient's species and condition often suffice. I is your intervention, such as a medical or surgical therapy, an environmental or behavioral change, or a diagnostic test. C is for comparison intervention or control, when appropriate. This might be applicable if you're comparing two diagnostic procedures or more than one option for therapy. O is for outcome. This is usually not a term that you enter into your search, but it's important to keep in mind when you're selecting literature, doing your critical appraisal, and making a decision. There may be other components to your question that you can include in your search, appraisal, and decision-making process, such as cost. Even if your question doesn't fit the PICO model, you can still break it into searchable terms. There are some tricks that will make your search more efficient. Using them can get you a manageable number of applicable results instead of thousands of articles that only roughly relate to your question. This can save you time. You can use wildcards, usually an asterisk, to truncate a word. This lets you avoid having to type multiple variations or endings for a word. Be careful not to truncate a word too far, or you'll get too many unrelated results. For instance, cat asterisk will get you cat, cats, catalog, category, catalepsy, catar, and other terms you probably don't want. Limits, such as by publication date, language, study type, or fields searched, let you narrow down a search that returns too many results. Phrase searching lets you exclude irrelevant results. Use quotes to return articles using the whole phrase, rather than mentioning the terms separately. Boolean operators, and, or, and not, connect multiple ideas together. If you've broken your question into terms using the PICO model, this is how you can string those terms together so that the database understands you or expands your search. A search for cats or dogs will return articles that include the word cats or the word dogs or both. And restricts your search. A search for insulin and diet will return only articles that include both words. Not restricts your search. A search for lymphoma not Hodgkin returns articles about lymphoma except for those that are about Hodgkin's disease. Be careful with this because you won't see results that talk about Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, so you may miss some results that would be useful. Most databases and search engines are programmed to ignore the words and, or, and not because every piece of writing in the English language uses them, making them useless as search terms. If you want the database to know that you mean OR as a command rather than a search term it should ignore, put it in all caps. Boolean searching can get more complicated when stringing together more than two search terms. People sometimes refer to Boolean searching as Boolean algebra because, like math, there's an order of operations. Unlike math, you don't necessarily know what the order is for any given database. To work with this, you can put parentheses around concepts that go together to force the database to address them in the correct order. In search engines, as in math, parentheses always come first. If you don't use them, the database won't necessarily know what you mean, and you'll get some confusing results. If you were to search for osteosarcoma or fibrosarcoma and dogs, a human would know that you wanted articles about dogs with osteosarcoma or fibrosarcoma. The database, though, will search for fibrosarcoma and dogs first, and then add in any results about osteosarcoma, burying the results for dogs among articles about osteosarcoma in humans, cats, and ferrets. Putting parentheses around the terms that go together in your search, as in the second example, forces the database to conduct the search in the correct order, gives you more accurate results, and saves your time. Subject headings are standardized terms used by a database to refer to a concept. When each article is indexed in PubMed, an indexer labels it with a medical subject heading or MeSH term. This does two things that can benefit you when you search. First, PubMed maps the terms you use onto the MeSH terms. That means you don't have to think of all the synonyms for a concept that an author might have used. Whether you search for heart attack, or cardiac infarction, or myocardial infarct, PubMed will bring you all the results that are indexed with the MeSH term myocardial infarction. This helps you retrieve more of the articles that are relevant to your topic. The second way MeSH terms can help you is that you can search them directly. If you search for MeSH terms instead of just keywords, you'll get more relevant results. This is because articles indexed with a MeSH term are actually about that topic, rather than just having the words appear in an abstract, for instance. This can help narrow down your search if you're getting too many results. 
Databases other than PubMed, like CAB, won't automatically map your search terms onto their subject headings, but they will suggest search terms that might improve your search. In the second part of the e-learning module, we'll take what we've learned and we'll apply it to an actual case. You can get to the second part of the module by returning to Carmen.